coming up on today's message with Pastor Johnny. Uh, No matter how bad the situation is, if you can keep your mind stayed on Jesus, you can be that much better. So Paul is locked up and he's still keeping his mind on Jesus, literally telling them to think about the other person like you would think about Jesus. Would you treat that other person, would you treat Jesus rather like you would treat your neighbor if Jesus was standing in front of you. Turn with me, if you will to the book of Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians, second chapter, starting with the fifth verse. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And ask all that are physically able to please stand uh, for the reading of God's word. Again, that is Philippians chapter two. I'll be starting at verse five and going all the way down to verse 11, hear ye the word of the Lord. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. God's word for God's people and God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, For the time that is ours to share together, I wanna talk a little bit about the greatest name, the greatest name. There's a young lady with the longest name in the Guinness Book of World Records. I'm going to call her Jamie uh, because her name starts with Jamie. And if I were to call her full name out, it is 1,023 letters in her full name. That's right, I said 1,023. She was born in 1991, and her name is a combination of 100 shorter names. 1,023 letters and two apostrophes. And her middle name has 36 letters on top of that. Uh, How do you come up with a name? of 1,023 letters. Uh, It's got a bunch of names. It's a combination of some of her relatives' names, words such as friend and love. It's got some car names in it. It's got some movie titles in it. It's got all kinds of stuff. Why? Because her mama wanted her to have a unique name. And registering her name was very challenging at the registrar's office in Houston, Texas. Uh, They had to use seven birth certificates, seven, and glue and staple them together just to register her name. It was such a process to to do this that uh, her name Uh, They created new rules that said you could no longer do that with the name. The name had to be a certain amount because they were typing these on the the birth certificate and there was only uh, five and one inch space uh, for that. So that was at best two lines. This 1,000 plus 
long name, uh, <laughs> reveals more about the mother than it does the child. Uh, she ended up uh, being born in 1991, but in 1997, uh, young Jamie and Jamie's mother went on the Oprah show and asked. And, and again, I said she came up with this 1,023-letter name with two apostrophes and a 36-letter middle name because she wanted it to be unique. Uh, but names have power. Uh, they become an essential part of who a person is, and a person who knows your name has a measure of power over you. Uh, have you ever heard your name crowd called in a crowded room and somebody yells out your name, you turn around and answer? Uh, you take notice. Therapists say when you're able to name your problem, that is when the recovery begins, when you can admit uh, the first step of any 12-step program, whether it be Alcohol Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or Sex Addicts Anonymous or Overeaters, when you admit what you are, that's the first step to recovery. Being able to name something has power, and but I wonder if that was more about the mother or the child, because we like the pomp and circumstance. We like the shine. We like to be looked at and be seen. Things change when the lights and the cameras go on. Things change when we're out in front of people. Things change when we have a title. Look at parades. Look at promotion ceremonies. Look at graduations. It's about that pomp and circumstance. Uh, remember when the choir used to process in an old school church? There's a pomp and circumstance about it. We like it. We like to be seen. And sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. Uh, as theologians Cardi B and Offset said, uh, we uh, do anything for clout. Do anything for clout. Uh, people want their name to be great. Philippi, as a city, wanted its name to be great. And not only did the city want its name to be great, but the church in Philippi wanted its name to be great. Philippi was a, a, a city that was uh, the civic and economic center of a Roman colony. People came from all over to be a part of Philippi, from all over uh, the area, because that was a diverse place to be. And uh, if you read your Bibles at home, Acts chapter 16 tells you how the church got founded there. Uh, the book of Philippians was a letter uh, written to the church at Philippi, and, and it was delivered by a man by the name of Epaphroditus. And he was sick. And almost to the point of death, and he recovered. And when he recovered, he was asked to deliver this letter to Paul, uh, from Paul, rather, to his church. And this letter became a popular book in the Bible. Real short, only four chapters, four, five, yeah, four chapters. You can read that in one sitting. You ain't got nowhere to go right now. You can read uh, that in one sitting. Uh, but it's got powerful messages in it. And Paul is writing to these people, and this text became known as a hymn. Some called it the Christ hymn. Some called it the Philippian hymn. But it became very popular, the passage that I read in your hearing. It became its own sort of pomp and circumstance, its own processional. But Paul was writing a letter to the church folk because the church folk had problems. Uh, not this church or any other church, but the church at Philippi had problems. There were people that were caught up in their titles. There were people that were caught up in the respect. There were people that wanted somebody to bend the knee, so to speak, to know who ought to be showing respect to whom, no matter what else was going on. Even though these people were, were worshiping at a time where worshiping could get them literally killed, it was illegal for at least 300 years to become a Christian. But even though it was illegal to be a public Christian and people were meeting in secret and they, were, they weren't allowed to go out, even though they weren't allowed to do any of that stuff, these church folks still found a way to argue. They were not aware of the situation around them and they wanted some folk to put some respect on their name. 
And everybody wanted to to have a certain title. And so Paul had to write a letter to them to get them off of this. I can't think of anybody right now. I'm sure if I go home and think about it, I can't. But I can't think of anybody right now that might be taking advantage of a situation and being more concerned about how the people talk about how great of a job they're doing as a leader and their title and their respect instead of actually trying to be a servant to the people. I can't think of anybody right now that might fall into that ladder. I can't think of anybody right now that might be participating in that and not demanding more of their leadership during a time and have to talk about how good and how great their leader is instead of talking about what can solve the problem. If I go home, though, and think about it, maybe something will come to mind. But they got taught, they got caught up on titles. They got caught up on clout. They got caught up on who would bend the knee to show that respect that they felt they deserved. And on top of the church folk arguing and the church being in disarray, the pastor is not there. The pastor is locked up. The pastor is in jail. And even though he's in jail, he still got to write a letter to the church folk to tell them what they need to be doing. Now, there are people who think that, you know, people have been believers as long as they've been believers. They ought not need the pastor to do everything and tell them everything. And they might be able to do some things on their own. But yet and still, while this man is locked up, he still has to fix what's going on in the church. And even though Paul is locked up. And even though he is in chains, even though Paul can't go out and about like he would want to, he can't go where he would like to go. He's confined. He's in voluntary quarantine. He still has the presence of mind to tell the church folk what they need to do to get out of their current predicament. He tells them in verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, even though Paul is locked up. Even though Paul can't go where he needs to go, even though Paul cannot do what he wants to do when he wants to do it, his mind is still focused on Jesus. Uh, No matter how bad the situation is, if you can keep your mind stayed on Jesus, you can be that much better. So Paul is locked up and he's still keeping his mind on Jesus, literally telling them to think about the other person like you would think about Jesus. Would you treat that other person, would you treat Jesus rather like you would treat your neighbor if Jesus was standing in front of you? You ain't got to answer. Just go ahead and think about that on your own. Would you keep that same energy that you had for that person that you're trying to give a piece of your mind when you really ain't got enough of your own mind to be giving out pieces to? Would you be able to give that person with Jesus the same kind of energy that you would give them? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Are you thinking Christly thoughts? Are you doing Christly things? Are you saying Christly things? Let this mind that is in you be like Christ. Jesus is showing us how to do these things. He's telling us that God is love. He says that him, uh, he's showing us what God is rather and letting us see what God is uh, by showing us love. It says that he says that in being in the form of God, uh, some texts literally translate that to be being in the image of God. Uh, You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Uh, How can you love uh, somebody you ain't seen, you ain't seen, and you don't love the person that you see every day? Uh, We are always somebody's definition of a Christian. When you think about something, I would guarantee you don't think about the the, the Webster's Dictionary form of it. When you think about defining something, you've got a person in mind. Uh, If you want to think about somebody, if you want to think about a definition of selfish, there's somebody that pops in your head that you think of that is selfish to let you know the definition of selfish. Uh, When you think about somebody that's loving, When you you think about the word loving, rather, you have somebody that comes in your mind that is loving. And so Paul is telling us to keep this mind that be in us. The same mind that is in us is the mind that Christ had in him. Are we being Christ-like with our 
thoughts. And he says that being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That's a whole bunch of fancy ways to say that even though Jesus was God wrapped up in human flesh, even though he was the one who was and is and is to come, even though he was the bishop of souls, even though he was the good shepherd, even though he was the rose of Sarah, and even though he was the way maker when you didn't have a way to make it, even though he was the doctor in the sick room and the lawyer in the courtroom, the one that was friends to the friendless and hope for the hopeless even though he was all that and then some he was still humble did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation stepped out of glory put on human flesh and lived a life that we couldn't live for us taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself. Some translations literally say that he emptied himself out. All of that God that was in him wouldn't be able to be held, so he emptied himself out even to the point of death. Even death on the cross. We wear crosses right now like it is fancy jewelry, like it is something to say I'm a Christian, and people argue about what the cross should look like, and one group has a cross sitting on a communion cup, and one group has a cross with flames on it, and another group has a cross, and it's still got Jesus on it, and everybody arguing about what is the cross and and what it really means, but during that time, that was a common instrument of torture. How how humble it is for the king of kings and the lord of lords to be executed like a common criminal. But he humbled himself even to the point of the cross. And because he was able to humble himself, he was highly exalted. Because he humbled himself, he was highly exalted. Uh, third time's a charm, they say, because he humbled himself, he was highly exalted. It's one thing to go in some place and think that you are all that and then some, and that everybody needs to recognize you and bow to your greatness, and then try to step up into the VIP section and get rejected. But it's something else that when you go to the place and you just be humble, And not cause a bunch of attention to yourself. And you get invited in to the VIP section because you were humble. If you can do that to go someplace, Jesus did that much more. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it says that he became flesh and dwelled among us. He stepped out of glory and lived a life, a human life, known what it was like to be hungry Known what it was like to be angry. Known what it was like to have these issues and deal with people. But he humbled himself. And because he humbled himself, he was highly exalted and given a name that was above every name. He was the man and God, both fully God and fully man. He was man enough to be at a wedding and upset that his mama was nagging him about making more wine for the, for the people at the wedding because they had run out. But he was God enough to say, okay, bring me uh, several barrels of water and turn the water into wine. And this wine was better than the wine that they were bought. He was both God and man. He was man enough to see the people that were hungry after he had been preaching for a while. But he was God enough to take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed over 5,000 people. He was man enough to be sleeping on a boat. <laughs> And and in the middle of a storm, the people came to him and said, Master, care not that we perish. But he was God enough to get up out of his nap and speak to the winds and the waves and say, Peace, be still. And even the winds and the waves obeyed him. He was man enough. Man enough to get annoyed at the woman from Canaan that kept yelling and screaming at him about her healing. But God enough to to, to, to heal the woman and save her. He was man enough that when his best friend Lazarus died, he cried at those when he heard about it. The text says that Jesus wept, but he was God enough to go to the tomb and say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus rose up. He had to call him by name because had he just gone to to the cemetery and said and come forth everybody in the cemetery would have got up he's man and God he's man enough
enough to have a body full of flesh and bones and God enough that Colossians says that the fullness of God was all wrapped in him. He's man and God. He's got a name that is more powerful than any name. Old young Jamie I mentioned at the beginning has 1,023 letters in her name, but there is a name that is bigger than her name. This much shorter, but it's much greater. J-E-S U.S. Joseph is the historian talks about him knowing at least 20 people with that same name back in his time but there's something different about the name that we call out. This is the name that your sins can be forgiven. I submit to you that there is only one name that can forgive your sins. Only one name that can save you. A name that is above all names. A name that causes demons to tremble. A name that causes the enemies to flee. A name that when it came on a donkey riding into Jerusalem people laid down palms and said Hosanna save us now because they knew that he was a savior a name that every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord a name that it tells you no matter where it's at whether it's above the earth whether it's on the earth whether it's under the earth every knee shall bow and tongue confess not some of the names not a few of the names all of the names this name is above every name there is a name I love to hear I love to sing its worth it sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth oh how I love Jesus oh how I love Jesus oh how I love Jesus because he first loved me and because of that name we'll get the glory as long as we keep our name and focused on Jesus as long as we keep our mind on the name that can save us we will get through this and we will get through this together in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come Thank you for listening to this message. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you found this message. If this message blessed you, be a blessing to someone else and share it. Connect with Pastor Johnny on Instagram and Twitter, and be sure to like Faith UMC Dickinson on Facebook.